Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'm joined with John Champaglia from Sprott Asset Management. I love when we get a chance to have John on because John gets to see how capital is flowing from a resource sense and from somebody who has a perspective of a company that is running a whole bunch of ETFs focused on resources. In this interview, we discuss where John sees capital flowing in the resource sector. We also get into uranium, where John sees it in this bull cycle. Also, I ask a question about if there's any redemption mechanisms with the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. So if you're uranium bull, you're probably going to want to watch that. And we also get into lithium and copper and where John sees those right now within their current cycles. All right, everybody, enjoy the interview. John, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me back. So one of my favorite things about talking to you and getting your insights is the idea that we could talk about capital flows with sort of a mining perspective. Now at Sprott, you get to see flows into ETFs and I'm sure you're having daily conversations with investors and fund managers about where you're seeing capital flowing, especially with a super focus on the resource sector. So what are you seeing right now in terms of those capital flows in regards to resources? Yeah, I would, uh, it's a good place to start because, you know, capital flows are, yes, they're, they're driven by fundamentals, but more often than not, they're driven by sentiment. Um, and investor sentiment right now seems to be single-handedly focused on all things uranium. So we obviously are monitoring um, different funds around the world, whether they're actively managed or passive ETFs, to understand like where the momentum is right now in the market. And you know, uranium has been the real winner, particularly over the last say six months. Um, but what's interesting to us is the the leadership amongst uranium has actually transitioned away from the physical commodity vehicles to the uranium mining equity. Uh, ETFs, which is really interesting. I think that's a function of risk appetite finally coming back to the sector. I think it's a function of the commodity price is now at such an elevated level. It makes you know almost every project in the world viable again. Um, and it is accelerating the restarts of a lot of uh, mothballed mines. So there's a lot of enthusiasm and, and I'd say disproportionate dollars are coming into the mining equity ETFs. Now, I was uh, recently at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, and uh, I've chatted with people who have been at some of the uranium uh, conferences, like the Red Cloud one, for example. And uh, what I'm hearing from just having conversations with people that are at these conferences, or myself being at some, is that the uranium people are the happiest people in the room. You go to Beaver Creek, which is a well-known gold conference, and everybody's super depressed about the lack of flows that are happening into gold. Now, what I find kind of strange in is that I can't recall being in a sector where it's like almost everybody I talk to, I sometimes suggest to them, well, you never know what could happen. We could be back down to seventy dollars uh, uranium in no time, and and it's everybody just shuts me down instantly, and they have the sentiment that no, this is just getting started. What's what's your read on what's happening specifically with uranium, and do you think that we're in the early stages of this bull cycle, do you think we're sort of uh, like in the thick of it? What's what's your read on it? Yeah, well, you, you raise a, a lot of interesting observations. I mean, look, investing in commodities and resource sectors is really challenging. Um, and I think why people are so excited about uranium is that there's such a unique setup here. And you know, look, the, the, there's no secret here. Like the, the, the industry has been operating with a supply deficit for years. So that's been known for, for a year or two years, three years, five years. So what's really changed? I mean, what's changed is that the demand for uranium is growing, is growing faster than people originally thought because the world's pivoting back to it. Japan is restarting reactors. 22 countries announced they're going to triple nuclear energy capacity by 2050. So we had an industry that was basically flatlined in terms of growth that will now grow, I don't know, three, four, maybe 5% a year for the next 20 odd years. So that's interesting. So the demand profiles improve. But with the uranium story, it's more of a supply story. And the reality is when you, when you have an industry and you starve it of, ca of capital for 10 years, and then all of a sudden you say, oh, we need this commodity again. Well, the industry is now learning some hard lessons, which is 
there are going to be, there's not going to be a smooth transition or supply response. And, you know, with every commodity cycle, you, you often have a bust uh, after a long boom. And why people are excited right now is because two of the largest producers of uranium in the world have told us in the last few months that they are having issues flexing up production. So irrespective of whether the price is 80 bucks or 90 bucks or 100 bucks a pound, these producers are having problems. And I think that's a function of having an industry that was you know, on, on care and maintenance for as long as it was, hadn't invested enough capital. Um, and now you've got a kind of catch up game to play because these projects, as you know, have very long lead times and they require a lot of capital to, to, to bring into production. So I think people are excited because they, they see that even though the price of uranium has gone from 60 bucks to $104 since September, that the consensus is we're just in the middle innings of this bull market. And I think that's why people are excited. Now, there's um, an analog I want to come back to later where I, I, something that I think about a lot is if what happened in uranium is going to happen with a bunch of other commodities where they're just so starved for capital for so many years that eventually the price just has to fly. Um, but I want to talk about the physical trust for a second, which you guys uh, are in large part to thank for what's happened for uranium investors and in, in, in sort of getting us out of this value trap. Um, so my understanding of, of the physical trust is that there's an ETF which shareholders can go and buy in, in the stock market. And then you guys take that cash and you effectively go and buy the actual physical uranium and, and store it. Now, are there any mechanisms that could force you guys to sell that physical uranium? Um, not really. Um, so the, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is a closed-end fund. And when it trades at a premium to its net asset value, which we publish every night, we have the ability to raise new capital. So we've we've been running this program for about two and a half years. Um, we've raised about 2.2 billion US dollars through this mechanism. We've purchased about 45 million pounds of U308 uranium, which we store in Canada, the United States, and France. Our total stockpile is now around 63 and a half million pounds. And it's a very simple vehicle. I mean, you basically participate in the price movements of the spot market. Uh, we're trading at a small discount to net asset value right now, which I think is largely a reflection of the fact that the price, the spot price has moved pretty quickly. I mean, at the end of 2023, we were at $91 a pound. We briefly hit 106. We're kind of floating around 103 to 104 right now. So it's had a big move. The trust has obviously uh, hit an all-time record high in terms of its asset and, and market price, I believe, on Friday. So it's been a huge success for our clients. Uh, the fund has grown 10 times in size because of market appreciation and, and inflows. Um, we have not sold a single pound since the inception of the trust. I think that's important to note. We have not lent out a single pound since inception of the trust. There's no redemption mechanism in the vehicle at this time. Um, so basically material goes in and we sequester it. So the only theoretical scenario um, where we would have to sell some material would be if I don't have enough cash in the fund to pay the management fee to ourselves, as well as all of the storage, insurance costs and whatnot, all the operating expenses, then yeah, we would have to sell some uranium, take the cash and um, <clears throat> you know cover that. But we've been pretty good about managing a small cash float so that we've had to avoid that thus far. Interesting. Um, now, my understanding is you guys applied uh, to get on, I think it was the NYSC uh, a couple of years ago. Um, is, is, is there any way that American investors have exposure to the ETF through a major ex exchange? Are there any plans to maybe attempt some sort of new vehicle or, or 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 new strategy to get access to us investors yeah so we tried uh, approximately two years ago to list uh on the new york stock exchange in the sec um did not approve our application because we we failed to meet two of the primary listing requirements which is having a physical redemption feature and also having a real-time spot market price that we publish um so we could publish um 
what they call an intraday indicative value or INAF. Those things don't exist, um, or we're not interested in, in, in entertaining that at the time. So what we've done in the interim is obviously um, the, the, the fund is available actually on the OTC best market in the U.S. under the ticker SRUUF. And believe it or not, I mean, it, it is very actively traded on that exchange. Um, the other way to access the trust is um, indirectly through our URNM ETF, which holds, um, I don't know what the exact number is right now, but it holds somewhere in the neighborhood of around 12 to 14% exposure uh, in the physical uranium trust itself. So um, you get some exposure along with obviously the, the rest of all the different miners and development companies and exploration companies all in one basket. But the, the OTC, t OTC best market ticker uh, is is uh, very, very actively traded. Um, okay, so ch changing gears here, uh, I want to ask you some questions about lithium, or at least a question about lithium. So we're now seeing some lithium companies changing their focus from lithium to uranium. This generally happens in junior mining. It's, it's nothing new. Um, what do you think is happening right now with lithium? We've We've seen some violent cycles in past years. Um, right now, it's definitely a hard time. We got spodumene concentrate is now trading, I believe, under a thousand dollars a ton, which makes many of these projects, many of these companies are publicly listed uneconomic. You think that this is just a lithium winter, and if so, how long do you think it's going to last? Well, it's pretty astonishing uh, to think about um, how quickly lithium went up in price and how quickly it's come down. Um, not totally surprising, but, you know, just to take a step back to provide some context, I mean, pre 2021, the price of lithium, uh, carbonate, uh, per metric ton was, you know, in the single digit thousands per ton, like sub $10,000 a ton. Um, then in 2021, the price took off all the way, you know, rallied for almost, almost two years um hitting a high of of uh, over eighty thousand dollars a metric ton and it was the best performing commodity bar none in in 2021 and 22 and what was driving that well we went from 3.2 million car sales ev car sales in 2020 to six and a half million car sales in 2021 to over 10 million ev car sales in 2022 so the industry basically tripled car sales and there was a shortage of lithium. And the reality is, is that there were projects that, you know, were supposed to come online two years prior to kind of sync up with demand, but they were behind schedule and there was a severe shortage. Um, and there was, you know, obviously uh, when you need the product, because you're not going to have the price of lithium hold up, you know, car production. So we've, we've since seen a pretty meaningful contraction of around 80 percent uh, we're around about 13 14 000 a metric ton so we're still above where we were in 2020 early 2021 but obviously we've had a meaningful correction as you mentioned projects are starting to get canceled or 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 uh, postponed or scaled back and that's you know a typical supply response that you would see so what's really driving it um well i think we've gone from an era of we were having 30 to 40% annual increases in EV sales globally to we're probably going to see 20% this year. So still very good growth, but growth is moderating. And with that moderation of growth, coupled with, I would say, inventory destocking at some of the battery makers in China, um, coupled with more supply coming online from projects that are finally getting to production, you've just had this kind of confluence of events that have pushed the price down we think the price is going to find some footing here um i think we're close to a bottom um but you know it, it, it's it's uh it's a nascent market meaning you know you have to take a step back and, and and remind yourself that lithium is a pretty small market relative to other metals um and it's a fairly immature market so these kind of you know, little mini booms and bust cycles are, are going to be more commonplace than you would say you would see in say something like copper, which is obviously a very well and mature market, well established and mature market. 
Now, you mentioned copper. I've got to get your thoughts on copper here. Uh, we keep seeing Jeff Curry appear on CNBC from Goldman Sachs, and he's got his quote, copper is the new oil. I think I think he, he appears every few months on CNBC saying that. Then we got Robert Friedland. Uh, uh, copper bulls can't get enough of his sound bites saying things like how we're down to days of inventory and how we've got this huge deficit upon us. But all that being said, every time I look at copper prices, they don't seem to want to budge. Uh, what's the disconnect here? What's what's your view on what's happening in copper? Yeah, well, I think it's important to put con, uh, copper in context against uh, other metals. So, for example, last year, copper was essentially flat. And so you, you might say, oh, gosh, it's not doing anything. It's just you know another year of, of no gain. But when you compare that against what happened in lithium and nickel and cobalt, um, even some of the energy markets, it was incredibly resilient and you say well why is it so resilient because the backdrop is you know in terms of world economic growth is not that great and as we know you know copper is often referred to as dr copper as being a barometer of the strength of the global economy so why did copper remain incredibly resilient last year well it's because the energy transition is creating i think real meaningful and durable uh demand uh for copper so yes copper for general industrial purposes and construction, soft. Copper for uh, renewable energy, grid investments, EVs, very resilient. Last year alone, uh, China added uh, the, the amount of solar, solar capacity that China added last year was uh, equivalent to what it added in the four prior years combined. So they have been growing solar like crazy. Even their wind um, deployment last year was up almost 100%. That is very copper intensive. Obviously, the grids to connect all that stuff, because if you think about where these solar farms are going, they're going in the desert in China. Nobody lives in the desert in China. So you need to run massive transmission lines across the country to bring the energy to urban centers. That's consuming a lot of, of copper as well. EVs are obviously very copper intensive. So yes, higher interest rates, and soft economic growth are definitely weighing on copper, holding it back. But our feeling is that once those, those headwinds are, are behind us, we get into more of a, an accommodative monetary policy and some industries start to come back, that combined with what we think is very durable energy transition related demand for copper is going to be very helpful for, for the metal. John, thanks so much for hopping on here. These you. You've got some really interesting takes on on um, all this stuff, and uh, I'm definitely going to be spending some time reading up on it tonight. Especially, I I, I didn't realize that China was so deep into uh, solar, uh, which is obviously also very fascinating for silver bulls. Um, uh, so th thanks thanks so much for hopping on here, um, and congratulations with all the su success you guys have had with the with the uranium physical trust. It's I, I think. Uh, given us junior mining investors something to get excited about every morning in, in, in an otherwise pretty stale period. And uh, I, I, I wish you guys continued success and hopefully you'll come back on here in the future and continue to share your insights with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, please smash that like button, subscribe and ring that notification bell. Also, let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks, everyone.